of delivering critical information to those who need it. Together we can expand the knowledge of our past, current and future ocean, leaving no country behind. A truly inclusive and integrated observing system can predict climate, forecast weather, monitor and manage ocean health, and offer real-time services for sustainable development. In the ocean we want, our global ocean observing system tells us about the state of our ocean, so we can respond to changing conditions wherever we are. Are you up to meeting this Ocean Decade Challenge? Join us today! Ocean Decade Challenge number eight. Create a digital representation of the ocean. How do we move from the ocean we have to the ocean we want? First, we must fully explore today's ocean. It's countless challenges and endless possibilities. Sometimes this means understanding the past and sometimes this means projecting the future. Today, we know more about the moon than we do the ocean but we have a unique opportunity to change this. Working with some of the best minds in ocean science, the Ocean Decade fosters partnerships to explore and fully map the ocean, creating a digital atlas of our planet's crown jewel, from surface to depths, from biodiversity to cultural and social values, from shorelines to open spaces. This knowledge will support dynamic and sustainable ocean management in a constantly changing ocean. Let's find new ways to see our past, current and future ocean through open data and freely shared information. Together, let's create an accessible ocean for present and future generations. In the ocean we want, we know everything about the ocean so that we may better protect and sustainably manage our planet's blue wealth. Are you up to meeting this Ocean Decade Challenge? Join us today. Ocean Decade Challenge 9. Deliver skills, knowledge and technology to all. How do we move from the ocean we have to the ocean we want? The answer is we don't. Unless we have the necessary skills, knowledge and technology readily available to every expert and citizen alike. If we are to reverse our planetary crisis together, everyone needs access to ocean information and the skills to turn that knowledge into sustainable solutions and action. Whether you work in science, government, business, civil society, or are a citizen committed to protecting the ocean, you can play a part in this open ocean knowledge revolution. The Ocean Decade encourages the exchange and sharing of skills, knowledge and technology to cultivate health responses that can collectively promote a clean, safe and accessible ocean for present and future generations. Let's use the Ocean Decade to build bridges between disciplines and across geographical and generational divides to radically open access to data, technology and skills and achieve together the ocean we want by 2030. Are you up to meeting this Ocean Decade Challenge? Join us today. Ocean Decade Challenge number 10. Change humanity's relationship with the ocean. How do we go from the ocean we have to the ocean we want? Let's start with a bit of imagination. Imagine an ocean that we no longer take for granted. An ocean that we respect for regulating our climate and inspiring hundreds of cultures around the world. Imagine the power of a whole generation of all ages and walks of life committed to saving our planet's largest ecosystem. Ocean knowledge gives us a clear picture of the worsening human impacts on the ocean. Education and ocean literacy give us the keys to changing our behavior so that we can protect the ocean. Time for change is running out, but the next 10 years of ocean action will be critical for a step change in our relation with the ocean. 
The Ocean Decade is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity for humanity to reconnect with the ocean, understand its importance to our survival, and use that knowledge to transform our relationship. In the ocean we want, we live respectfully with our shared ocean, carefully and sustainably managing its precious resources. Are you up to meeting this Ocean Decade Challenge? Join us today. Ocean Decade Challenge number one. Understand and beat marine pollution. How do we move from the ocean we have to the ocean we want? Today, we see plastic waste everywhere, from the ocean depths to the remotest islands of the Pacific. Yet the ocean is also menaced by pollution we cannot see. Untreated sewage, pesticides and fertilizers, toxic chemicals, heavy metals and other harmful substances. They're not just a threat to marine life, but also to human health and livelihoods. The Ocean Decade is an opportunity to identify, map and reduce these sources of pollution. Working hand-in-hand, hand, scientists, businesses, governments and many other groups can create and roll out solutions that eliminate pollution at the source, reduce its impacts and deliver a clean ocean for us all. And as consumers, we all have an important role to play over the next 10 years to beat marine pollution. In the ocean we want, we embrace habits of buying and consuming that help keep our ocean clean and healthy. Are you up to meeting this Ocean Decade Challenge? Join us today! Ocean Decade Challenge number two, protect and restore ecosystems and biodiversity. How do we move from the ocean we have to the ocean we want? Until recently, marine ecosystems were largely untouched and teeming with rich biodiversity. Yet something has changed over the last 50 years. Coral reefs, top ocean predators, and some of our last pristine marine ecosystems are vanishing. How much more damage must occur before we take action? Healthy marine ecosystems protect our coastlines from storms and erosion, providing safe habitats for millions of species key to nature's equilibrium, offering food security to billions of people and shielding against climate change. The Ocean Decade fosters an understanding of the challenges facing our ocean so we can live in harmony with nature. Networks of marine protected areas combined with nature-based solutions can sustain our needs and livelihoods while rebuilding a mindful, sustainable and equitable relationship with our shared ocean. Acting as one global community, we can harness knowledge to build tools that protect, restore and manage marine and coastal ecosystems. In the ocean we want, marine ecosystems are cherished and understood, keeping our ocean healthy and resilient. Are you up to meeting this Ocean Decade Challenge? Join us today. Ocean Decade Challenge number three. Sustainably feed the global population. How do we move from the ocean we have to the ocean we want? The ocean has nourished us for thousands of years, fueling and strengthening our communities while underpinning human health and development. Yet growing populations, along with greater awareness of the harmful impacts of land-based meat sources, have driven the demand for ocean-based alternatives. This has led to bigger and unsustainable fishing, trawling and dredging the ocean floor, disturbances in the ocean food web and disappearing fish species. Is there time to restore ocean seafood resources? Yes. The Ocean Decade allows scientists, governments and industry to explore and implement innovative solutions that reduce pressure on marine ecosystems by restoring and managing fish stocks, improving aquaculture and harvesting sustainable seafood. Consuming sustainable seafood is an easy way to join the Ocean Decade. Together, we can support communities relying on seafood resources for their livelihoods while multiplying the seafood the ocean supplies. In the ocean we want, 
We protect crucial ocean habitats and harvest seafood mindfully so we can always rely on the ocean to feed the global population. Are you up to meeting this Ocean Decade Challenge? Join us today. Ocean Decade Challenge number four. Develop a sustainable and equitable ocean economy. How do we move from the ocean we have to the ocean we want? The ocean provides livelihoods and nourishment for hundreds of millions of the world's poorest people. The global economy depends on the ocean through fisheries, energy, tourism, and transport. The way we manage and share the ocean's limited resources has a global impact on coastal communities, indigenous peoples, and marine ecosystems. Let's seize the ocean decade to unlock transformative ocean science solutions that connect people with the ocean in a productive cycle. Investing in ocean science and technological innovations will create employment opportunities around the world and multiply sixfold the amount of seafood available. A clean, healthy ocean also impacts tomorrow's renewable energy sources, minerals, and medical breakthroughs. Over the next 10 years, Blue Knowledge will give us the tools to use and manage our marine resources for a healthy and productive ocean, for the well being of humankind and the planet. In the ocean we want, both society and planet benefit from an equitable and sustainable ocean economy so no one is left behind are you up to meeting this ocean decade challenge join us today ocean decade challenge number five unlock ocean-based solutions to climate change how do we move from the ocean we have to the ocean we want? The ocean is our greatest ally against climate change. It absorbs heat and carbon in the atmosphere. Mangroves and coral reefs protect communities against climate change effects. Ocean-based energy reduces harmful greenhouse gas emissions. But our ocean is unhealthy, with rising temperatures and sea levels, acidic waters, shrinking glaciers, disappearing ecosystems and species, intense weather events, and fish populations shifting toward cooler waters. This leaves our planet and humanity at great risk. Time is ticking. Life and livelihoods in many small island states are already suffering. Ocean science helps us understand ocean climate interactions with data and knowledge to predict and respond to changes. Together, let's harness the ocean decade for ocean-based solutions to help mitigate, adapt, and build resilience to climate change. Like making smarter investments in technologies that lower greenhouse gas emissions. From mountain to seashore, from small island communities to the largest cities. In the ocean we want, our ocean protects us and makes us resilient to climate change. Are you up to meeting this Ocean Decade Challenge? Join us today. Ocean Decade Challenge number six. Increase community resilience to ocean hazards. How do we move from the ocean we have to the ocean we want? Rising sea levels, harmful algae blooms, and more frequent destructive storms are putting the lives and livelihoods of coastal communities around the world in jeopardy. As threats increase, experts and authorities must have the knowledge to issue warnings, and communities must have the skills and information to respond effectively. The Ocean Decade will foster investment in more effective forecast and early warning systems so we can reduce risks and save lives on land and at sea. From global early warning systems to coastal cities and communities ready to face tsunamis, storm surges and rising sea levels, to coastal and marine ecosystems that are protected and can offer nature-based solutions to protect communities and infrastructure. 
Let's harness ocean knowledge to empower individuals and prepare communities so they are ready to face natural ocean hazards. In the ocean we want, people and communities are safe and resilient because we can reduce and respond to the hazards of a dynamic ocean. Are you up to meeting this Ocean Decade Challenge? Join us today. Ocean Decade Challenge number seven. Expand the global ocean observing system. How do we move from the ocean we have to the ocean we want? We're all connected through one shared ocean, from the coast to the high seas, from the ocean surface to its depths. Sharing information and technology keeps us safe, our economies productive, and our ocean healthy. Through ocean observing systems, scientists, experts, and governments share observations for climate, operational services, and marine ecosystem health. But the current system has gaps and lacks institutional and financial support. Let's seize the ocean decade as a chance to amplify this system's impact, making it sustainable and capable of delivering critical information to those who need it. Together we can expand the knowledge of our past, current and future ocean, leaving no country behind. A truly inclusive and integrated observing system can predict climate, forecast weather, monitor and manage ocean health, and offer real-time services for sustainable development. In the ocean we want, our global ocean observing system tells us about the state of our ocean, so we can respond to changing conditions wherever we are. Are you up to meeting this Ocean Decade Challenge? Join us today! Ocean Decade Challenge number eight. Create a digital representation of the ocean. How do we move from the ocean we have to the ocean we want? First, we must fully explore today's ocean. It's countless challenges and endless possibilities. Sometimes this means understanding the past and sometimes this means projecting the future. Today, we know more about the moon than we do the ocean but we have a unique opportunity to change this. Working with some of the best minds in ocean science, the Ocean Decade fosters partnerships to explore and fully map the ocean, creating a digital atlas of our planet's crown jewel, from surface to depths, from biodiversity to cultural and social values, from shorelines to open spaces. This knowledge will support dynamic and sustainable ocean management in a constantly changing ocean. Let's find new ways to see our past, current and future ocean through open data and freely shared information. Together, let's create an accessible ocean for present and future generations. In the ocean we want, we know everything about the ocean so that we may better protect and sustainably manage our planet's blue wealth. Are you up to meeting this Ocean Decade Challenge? Join us today!
Hello and welcome to the wrap-up of our fourth Ocean Decade Laboratory, A Healthy and Resilient Ocean, hosted by the German Federal Ministry of Education and Research in partnership with the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission of UNESCO. And this event comes to you live from a studio in Berlin. My name is Monica Jones. I'm very happy to be back to guide you through the next 90 minutes as we review the highlights of Wednesday's core event and also a recap some of the 32 satellite activities that have taken place over the past 48 hours. Now, some of you may join us uh, for the very first time, so let me just briefly bring this event uh, into some context, because the United Nations General Assembly proclaimed 2021 to 2030 as the United Nations Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development, in short, the Ocean Decade. And the aim is to bring together scientists and stakeholders to help restore the ocean, which is our planet's largest ecosystem, and prepare the path for a sustainable development. Now, the first International Ocean Decade Conference kicked off last year, and it's now being followed by seven Ocean Decade Laboratories, each of which is focusing on one specific Ocean Decade outcome, this one on a healthy and resilient ocean. And before we start reviewing the activities of the past 48 hours, uh, also just briefly a word or two about our event platform, because for one, obviously you're in the live stream, because otherwise you wouldn't see or hear me, uh, and you can uh, follow the event uh, in various languages, English, uh, French, Spanish, or English with subtitles. If you want to get a good overview of what exactly is in store in the next 90 minutes, you can scroll below the live stream. There's an agenda with all the information. Very interesting for you should be the left-hand column because there are a lot of buttons with lots of interesting activities like the launch button uh, on the top left. Here you can review laboratories that already took place. Uh, further down you find a button saying satellite activities. Here you get more in-depth information about those 32 satellite activities but as I mentioned we will recap some of those live now during our wrap-up. And the ocean library button is also very interesting for you because here you find tons of materials, photos, documents, you name it. You can download and share them. As long as you credit the author, you find the frequently asked questions section here and you also find information on the expert roster and I'm going to tell you later what uh, that means and why that is important. Uh, but I just mentioned it at this point already. If you use Twitter, uh, then we would very much appreciate if you use the hashtag Ocean Decade. Um, and back here in the studio, because you see them already, it would be rude of me not to mention them. Obviously, I'm joined again by the co-chairs of this Ocean Decade Laboratory, Karen Wiltshire, a Vice Director at the Alfred Wigner Institute and Director Biological Station on Helgeland Island, so very close to the sea. Karen, good to have you with us. And Tim Jenajan, the Head of the Work Group Ecological Biogeochemistry at the Leibniz Center for Tropical Marine Research in Bremen. Uh, nice to see you too. The last 48 hours uh, were busy. The core event, you were super busy. You had uh, hopefully two good nights sleep since. Um, great input from all the speakers. Is there anything where you woke up this morning and say that that just resonates right up until now? Definitely. It's uh, this whole event packed full of these ideas by people. There's, we learned there's not only one definition for the health of the ocean, but there's many, many visions, and we got them from all kinds of stakeholders. I think that's one of the very important um, memories that I have and that I will take home also. Right. Truly inclusive. Really inclusive from science through to every person in different walks of life. Really, really interesting. And I'm looking forward to the end of all of this and thinking about how we're going to move through to the future. And of course, so many parts of the world as oh, well. Yeah. And uh, I think we even have a graphic uh, prepared that uh, shows us where people uh, were participating in the core event. Maybe we see it now. There it is. Yeah, I mean, it's quite fascinating. I mean, obviously, we're in Berlin, so the majority uh, based in Europe, but I find it fascinating, uh, you know, with the time 
different time zones as well. Someone did without their breakfast, Monica. I can see that very clearly. <laughs> Thank you for joining. It's amazing, really, isn't it? It, it, yeah. it is amazing. Well, yeah. some people maybe are, you know, the, 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 the owl type who stays yeah. up late at night and the lark type who gets up early in the morning. But I find this very impressive. And I think, uh, Tim, what you also said, I mean, this, they come from all walks of life. It's not just the science community, not just academia. That's the important thing, of course. It's done by scientists and we're reaching out to scientists, but uh, half of the people are not from academia. Mm. And that is, I think, very encouraging. And it's, it's something that we should take up, in particular, as scientists. Yeah. We have to communicate more with them, with those people outside academia. Yeah. I think they're more important than we are, Tim, actually. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> point is that this sort of diversity also of, of stakeholders interested, uh, luckily interested in it, uh, became very clear during the core event. And uh, obviously, we can't review the entire core event. It lasted for four hours. But we did uh, uh, put together a short summary. And uh, I would suggest we watch that video now. Welcome to our fourth Ocean Decade Laboratory, focusing on a healthy and resilient ocean. The Ocean Decade is an important element in paving the way to a sustainable future. So, a healthy and resilient ocean. This is actually one of the uh, ultimate targets of the Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development, because it will uh, embrace all the achievements that we need to make. In my role as co-chair of the Global Observing System, I think that the ocean must be well observed to stay healthy. I would like to emphasize the importance of framing oceans as social ecological systems. And that is the health and resilience of our oceans is intertwined with the health and resilience of our societies. What is key for us is the fact that um, we have to begin to understand that we cannot have a economy or a blue economy without a healthy ocean. The center of Coral Triangle is also uh, known as the most diverse, not only coral species, but at the same time, it is actually the center of marine biodiversity of, of this planet. I think there's there's been a really interesting move towards the use of citizen science uh, to help scientists to observe the oceans. A healthy ocean would be synonymous with a clean or rather sustainable habitat. I think the ocean is very resilient, but we have taken it for granted for too long. I think social health is important because the ocean is a home for millions of species. My vision of a healthy ocean is that the ocean free from pollution. Not only for the ocean's sake, but for our own. I would say the first step on the path to do something is to go to the ocean and sit there and breathe and feel. It's also important for the younger generation and the older generation to, to work together so we can all together find solutions for these problems. It's that sentence. We need head knowledge, which is, I suppose, us really, isn't it, in a way? Yes. Heart and motivation, which is you young ladies down there, don't lose it. Yeah, and hands-on action, which is everybody cleaning up the beaches if it takes it. Um, really at the end. So thank you for that comment out of the public. We have elders in our region who have come up with this concept of two-eyed seeing, where they're acknowledging Western science and traditional indigenous knowledge systems as two things that should be used together in order to get the best possible science. Like I envision it's kind of a quilt that all of these solutions together 
will help broaden the planet. For example, there's a partnership in Palau between a community of fishermen, and they're working closely with the Scripps Institute, um, the University of California, San Diego, uh, doing research on and monitoring of coral reef. So the, the scientists from the research institute are working in partnership with the communities. What's quite clear is um, we need to communicate more. There must be more communication, more collaboration between science and society. And we need more events like this, for example, to bring people together and to discuss these issues and spread the word. We need to involve everyone and because we are all custodians of this blue planet. So those were some of the highlights of the four-hour core event uh, that took place on Wednesday. And I have to say, uh, I mean, some of the contributions there were really, really moving. Uh, all of them were absolutely uh, interesting and valuable, but there was such a variety of input. Um, what do we do with that now? How do we bring all of that together in order to actually turn them into action? Well, Monica, I think that is the next step in this grand challenge of what I said, we are all custodians uh, of this planet and this ocean. And I think we need to really think uh, in future as to how we're going to network the different parts of society and the different interests and all the stakeholders. And I, I guess, yeah, the emotional side with the scientific side and feelings with the actual issues on hand. And that is something yeah, that requires some dialogue, I think, overall. With, with many different parts of society, right, yeah. Tim? Definitely. I'm, I'm really getting goosebumps when I see this video and, yeah. and all this is coming back to me. I thought, um, and that's also important. We, we see the obvious every day, and, and we saw it also here. It's we want healthy coral reefs, whales, penguins, etc. But there's also a lot of the, the unseen that we need to take into account, something that was also mentioned, maybe not in this video, the important role physical oceanography plays for a healthy ocean. That is also important. We didn't discuss about the deep sea. There's uh, hydrothermal fluids uh, nourishing um, micro and macro organisms in 5,000 meters water depth. That is also part of a healthy ocean. So there's more of this information necessary, not only the obvious, and of course then the challenge to keep this, to maintain this, and to go a step further and, and yeah, bring all the society and science together to work towards this healthy ocean. I think we do have a decade for this, though, and that might yeah. be very useful uh, when you see the diversity Absolutely. and what Tim just said, that we might actually have not been able to show in two days so what it's all already, about. Mm -hmm. We're already almost two years into it. Yeah. So yeah. From, uh, from mm. 10 years, we mm -hmm. sort of have eight left. So, so eight left yeah. to do a lot. Okay. So mm. we need to provide more of these impulses and, and then nice, go into action. Yeah. And the network platform should be there for um, yeah. maybe mm. the future. Mm. We really, uh, yeah. Exactly, because uh, you, you brought up a, a fantastic example of, uh, of you know, hands-on and uh, activity of where different parts of society work together in order to, to save a coastal area, to, to make it better and more sustainable. Um, but those examples aren't readily available to anyone or everyone. Yeah? Exactly. And mm. what we did see is that there are lots of people out there doing mm. loads of different things to help mm. and mm. come up with fantastic ideas way beyond even science. And we need to somehow network those brilliant ideas so that we move forward in a positive direction. That's actually a perfect cue mention using the word network because uh, the the platform the event platform of the ocean decade laboratories uh is also bringing people together behind the scenes if you like uh so i would like to focus uh on that right now because uh, uh the core event yes brought together really great people from all parts of the world which is also something that is always wonderful to see um 
that also happened on the event platform. And over the past 48 hours, participants really made use of, of the possibilities uh, to interact, to engage with one another, to, to present their views. Um, and I would like to uh, explore that a little bit. And luckily, we have uh, two speakers uh, who one after the other will share their experience, their views with us on this. Uh, first of all, I would like to welcome Xialin Shang. She is a knowledge exchange specialist and project manager at the Leibniz Center for Tropical Marine Research, where she is primarily engaged with the Sino-German collaboration project. Uh, Xialin, uh, first of all, it's so very good to, to have you on board. Uh, and reading your biography, um, it also became clear that your work aims to promote the connection between science and society. And I don't know if you joined us uh, probably during the core event. I mean, that is something that became clear uh, that that is so important uh, to, to bridge uh, the communication between these two uh, groups of people, science and society. And you promote this connection through different ways of measuring stakeholder engagement. I, I'd be very much interested uh, to hear your impression uh, of what was happening on the event platform, the kind of content that was available and how it was used, Jaline. Yeah, thank you very much, Monica. Uh, it's really great to be here today on this Friday afternoon and to share with you some of the highlights of uh, the event platform, uh, especially after so many things going on during the last three days. So when I checked this morning, there were more than 600 people registered on the event platform for this specific event. And uh, the event platform serves us not only as an uh, information hub, so where you can find all the detailed agendas, the speaker's information, if you click on the speaker's corner. It is also serves us as a communications part. So if you use interactive networking tables offered on the platform, and um, you can hold or simply join one of the network tables and communicate and interact with the people from all over the world who also care about our ocean. So among all those different functions, I, I, I don't have time to go through all of, all of them. I picked up two highlights and uh, I would like to share with you next. So the first highlight on the event platform, I would say, I mean, no doubt will be uh, our different satellite activities. So if you look at platform, you will find the information of all the 32, 32 satellite activities. And geographically, it is ranging from uh, New Zealand, India, and China, and then come to Germany, Brazil, and the, all the way to Canada, and the, um, no, yeah, all the Brazil, and so on. And it also um, covers uh, very diverse topics, including hot topics, such as plastic pollution, ecosystem service. Uh, it also covers some novel topics, for instance, how can fashion contribute to a, ocean, a, a healthy and resilient ocean. And yesterday, I myself, and also together with Tim Yan and Yang, the co-chair of the event, we also held our, our own satellite activities. As Monica just said, uh, we focus on how can science and the uh, a society contribute and build for a healthy and resilient ocean together. And we had more than 700 people watching from our live streaming website. So we were very excited to see it really attract attention and uh, it's really excellent opportunity to uh, raising awareness among the people about our ocean and uh, ocean's healthy. And another interesting aspect about this event platform, I would say, is the Ocean Decade booths, which are also exhibition, exhibition areas of even the platform. And currently, there are three um, booths on the platform and our institute, so Labney Central for Tropical Marine Research. They are very honored to have one of the booths on the platform. If you click on the booths, you will find our basic information and also the recent highlights activities going on in our institute. And besides us, there is also a second booth regarding the magical ocean video project. So you can watch all those amazing videos and the films and showing the magic of the ocean from a human um, perspective. And then we have the third booth, Anna Mandu. You can find her beautiful photos and um, paintings and other artistic works. So to summarize my talk, um, 
no, my, my report today, I'm very um, impressed to see how much this event platform can offer to us. And moreover, I'm very excited to see so many people join us through this platform to join us to care for our ocean, to protect our ocean, to build a healthy and a resilient ocean together. Thanks, Monica. Thank you. Thank you, Salid. And uh, uh, when you, you the, the way you talk about the event platform, uh, I can't help but thinking, well, then this format uh, seems to be sort of one positive of uh, a very tragic event, namely the pandemic that has forced us uh, to come together in this way uh, and actually explore uh, all the technical possibilities that the digital events such as this one uh, offer and an event platform like this one uh, seems to work really well. Uh, thank you so much for that and uh, I would really like to uh, get just one more perspective uh, because we do have a second speaker who was also uh, very much engaged with our event platform, uh, Dennis Sharper. He is the manager of the Schutzstation Wattenmeer on the island of Süd in Germany uh, and Schutzstation of course, can be translated something like the Wadden Sea Conservation Station. It's a non-profit NGO in North Germany. It's running continuous monitoring programs, including bird monitoring, coastal monitoring. And it also carries out a wide program of guided tours. And of course, it is a very, very attractive uh, holiday region for a lot of people. They're trying to be close to nature. Uh, Dennis, thank you so much for joining us. Um, and I'd be very much interested to hear from you what kind of activity Activities on this event platform you found uh, particularly interesting and helpful? Okay, we can see you, Dennis. We cannot hear you. Looks like we lost you. I've been told earlier uh, that we do have some technical problems. Um, I think there's a problem with the connection with Dennis. But I do know that uh, apart from, obviously, I would love to talk to him, so maybe we can get him back. But I also know that he has a video that he wanted to share with us. So maybe while we're trying to reconnect with Dennis, maybe we can uh, have a look at the video that he prepared for us. Sylt, weiße Sandstrände, sich in der Sonne regelnde Seehunde, leises Plätschern im Weltnaturerbe Wattenmeer. Die größte deutsche Nordseeinsel ist ein Naturparadies. Sylt ist auch ein Urlaubsort für zahlreiche Gäste. Nicht jedem Gast ist dabei bewusst, wie es um den Zustand des Meeres hier steht. Das Alfred-Wegener-Institut betreibt Forschung zum Wattenmeer. Dr. Annika Cornelius kennt die Herausforderungen für ein gesundes und resilientes Wattenmeer. Auch der Klimawandel, den es sonst natürlicherweise auch gab, ist durch den Menschen verstärkt. Und diese Einflüsse, die wirken sich durchaus negativ auf unser Wattenmeer aus. Und da muss man eben schauen, wie kann man das eventuell stoppen, wo kann man da handeln, um das Meer und das Wattenmeer besser zu schützen. Damit die Informationen auch an Sylter und Gäste gelangen, sind viele Freiwillige auf der Insel im Einsatz. Wir haben auch Führungen, wo wir eben dann den Menschen die Natur hier näher bringen, also in den Naturschutzgebieten, aber auch im Nationalpark Wattenmeer, wo wir eben dann zeigen wollen, wie einzigartig eigentlich dieser Lebensraum ist, wie besonders und wie schützenswert auch. Und wir machen das so ein bisschen auch nach dem Motto, man kann nur das schützen, was man auch kennt. Und deswegen ist es eben so wichtig, dass dann auch schon die Kinder bei den Führungen irgendwie begeistert von dem Lebensraum sind und vielleicht dann später sich denken, ja, das möchte ich irgendwie schützen. Aufklären und Wissen vermitteln, das ist auch sein Job. Thomas Dietrichsen ist als einer der vier ehrenamtlichen Seehundjäger auf der Insel für den Schutz der Meeressäuger im Einsatz. Wenn ein Seehund am Strand liegt, ist es erstmal nichts Ungewöhnliches. Das ist Nationalpark Wattenmeer. Wir sind hier in der Natur und das ist sein Zuhause. Wichtig ist, dass man das Tier in Ruhe lässt, dass man Achtung und Respekt vor dem Tier hat und dass man, soweit es geht, größtmöglichen Abstand gewährt. Eine der offensichtlichsten Krankheiten des Meeres? Müll. Rund 240.000 Kilogramm sammelt allein der Insel Süd Tourismus Service an den Stränden in Westerland und Randum ein. Trotzdem findet Heike Werner von der privaten Initiative Bye Bye Plastik Sylt bei jedem Strandspaziergang noch Fischernetze, Plastik und anderen Unrat am Strand. Es ist total schockierend. Es ist unser Menschenmüll, der da im Meer ist. Es, der kommt ja nicht von irgendwo her. Und es macht halt was mit einem und es äh, gibt dir auch eine Bereitschaft, sein eigenes Konsumverhalten zu ändern. Müll sammeln am Strand. Damit kann wohl jeder einen Beitrag leisten. 
Worauf aber kommt es sonst noch an? Zum einen sollte man sich informieren und ähm, das kann man an ganz vielen öffentlichen Stellen. Das geht natürlich auch wunderbar übers Internet. Einfach mal auf die Seiten schauen, was gibt es, wie geht es dem Meer äh, vor meiner Haustür und was kann ich auch vielleicht tun, um den Meereszustand zu verbessern. Und dann einfach auch mit Freunden, mit Familie drüber reden, um eben die breite Öffentlichkeit zu erreichen. Wenn ähm, viele etwas tun, dann wird es am Ende auch ähm, spürbar. Du kennst die Nordsee, du liebst die Insel. Engagiere auch du dich für den Schutz des Meeres. Well, that was the video that uh, Dennis Sharper from the Wadensee Conservation Station uh, on the island of Sylt uh, shared with us. And he also wanted to tell us a little bit more about uh, that particular coastline, that particular region, and uh, how it is accessible on the event platform like this Film, for example, you can review when you go on the event platform and you go either to the Ocean Booth or the Ocean Decket Library. Uh, sadly, we can't reach Dennis. Uh, the connection, for some reason, uh, just won't establish. Uh, but uh, the video, the video, I think, was a very strong one and uh, told us a lot. Which means we now have something like a minute more to review the satellite activities. And given that we have quite a few to look at, uh, that's not a bad thing. Because next to the core event and the online activities, 32 satellite activities took place over the last two days. The first one starting right at the end of the core event and uh, the final satellite activity uh, finishing just about two hours ago. At this point, I would like to, I'm sure on behalf of everyone here, including the co-chairs, to thank uh, everyone who uh, played a part in those satellite activities, the organizers, the speakers, and also the participants in particular, uh, many of whom had to miss out on a good night's sleep in order to participate, because the activities took place all around the world in quite different time zones. A very busy 48 hours there. And again, thank you to everyone involved. Let's recap some of those satellite activities right now, starting with fashion for a healthy and resilient ocean. 
You may not know this, but fashion is one of the largest polluters of the ocean. Fashion can also help track unsustainable activities and keep them in check. And this satellite activity discussed maritime transport, fashion, the dyeing industry, and plastic pollution. Uh, and there's so much more to tell about the satellite activity. And for that, I would like to welcome now Runa Ray, fashion designer, CEO, and founder of Mojo Design Studios, Runa Ray. And uh, Runa, we already met during the first Ocean Decade Laboratory and inspiring and engaging ocean. So it's so very good to have you back. Do tell us a little bit about your satellite activity now. Thank you so much, Monica. Lovely to see you once again. And uh, this is definitely a very important uh, event for, the, for a healthy and resilient ocean. So my satellite activity basically focused on marine pollution, which was plastics and the dyeing industry and how we as individuals could work together in making this better. Because to give you a gist, we know that the fashion industry is responsible for 20% of the global wastewater because of the textile uh, finishing processes and, of course, the dyeing industry, which includes the carcinogenic dyes, which are harmful to man and marine animals. So while most countries have their production, which is outsourced from developing countries, they, they do not have water right, recycling in place. And what happens is that these units are then located near rivers and water bodies where effluents easily escape unnoticed and most of it happens at night. There is this common saying that they say that you would know the color for the next season when you see the dogs wading through the water and getting out, which is unfortunate, but if the dogs were blue, you'd know that blue is gonna be the color. And if the dogs were pink, then you had pink, which is gonna be the main color for the season. So we, and another important uh, factor that we all know about is plastics, right? Where plastics uh, uh, contribute to the microfiber pollution and even any sort of plastic that goes into making of the garment, even your buttons or even the mannequins that actually exist in the fashion industry. So my satellite session focused on that, speaking with a Nat Geo research scientist who spoke about microfibers, uh, Lonely Whale, which is a corporate that is fighting the use of single-use thin film plastics and how we need to work together for solutions. So now while we speak about this, we are actually talking about, right now the discussion is happening about a one trillion investment that is going to be garnered towards decarbonizing fashion where most of the emissions come from the manufacturing industry and, of course, the agricultural stage of, uh, fashion, of the fashion industry, where cotton is one of the largest crops and you have pesticides which go into making cotton. And, of course, you have the pollution runoffs that get into the marine effect, uh, into areas, marine areas, and affect those. So while research and developments are being made, a huge chunk is also being spoken about material innovation, bioplastics, dry processing, which uses no water. While all of this is in R&D, we are still looking to find solutions for 2030. Now, if you ask me how fashion can probably measure these activities, it's, it's like the questions I asked uh, everybody I've interviewed for the Ocean Decade. How is it that the industry is mapping the, you know, the carbon footprint? But imagine fashion like an onion, right? It's got several layers and all layers are like the industries that support the core. And it is strategically held together by the skin of glamour. So while each layer has this importance, if one layer gets spoiled, the en entire onion gets spoiled. So as of now, each layer is functioning separately and supporting the core, but there's no general consensual mapping which is put into place. So you have independent organizations, you have large brands who have goals within the organization that help map their processes. But I believe that we need to have a common goal, a common consensus, because if you look at the fashion industry as a whole, it's highly unorganized. And you have a lot of countries, especially the sub countries that contribute to garment manufacturing and cotton growing. And when you have this so highly unorganized, it's very difficult to map it, especially when governments are working separately from the industry itself. So how do we basically map these pollution levels, you know, given for given for example, like what we spoke about, like the dying or the pesticide run, runoffs. So 
my idea is, and which I would, which I'm planning to propose for Stockholm 50, which I was happy to get the special accreditation for, was that we need to have fashion VNRs. So when we have these fashion VNRs, then each country will have the possibility of reporting onto it on an annual basis and also learn from other countries. So it's like a give and take mechanism, which will create actions that are urgent and necessary for the healthy seas and our planet. It was a long answer, but I tried putting a lot in. That was a brilliant answer. And I was uh, I was about to pick up exactly on what you said at the end when you said this proposal. What was the reaction uh, in, uh, during your satellite activity? Uh, are people on board already? Certainly those uh, that took part in it. What was your impression? So the satellite activity was basically aimed towards the fashion industry. So it was kept very simple. There were no acronyms. There was simple English. It was almost like a child asking questions. Because to tell you the truth, when we speak about shipping in the fashion industry, we don't even think it relates to us. Mm. Because if you talk about logistics, then we're like, yes, maybe. But we don't even think that shipping, most of us don't think about shipping being a huge part of the industry. So how do you educate the, you know, the future fashion designers? on to knowing as to what is important for the environment. And I always believe that science and design has to learn from each other and vice versa. So to wrap it up, I think it was a good response. There were a lot of students who got to see it and decided that their future collections have to be carbon negative, not just in certain processes, but then mostly towards the oceans because everything is connected to water. Right. Well, but this is very interesting what you're saying there because it basically uh, a lot of players in the fashion industry from those who start but also those who are already sort of set in there are, are completely unaware that they are part of a bigger picture uh, and that's not just for the fashion uh, industry that's, that goes for so many uh, sectors and industries uh, when mm -hmm. you don't feel that whatever action whatever product you're, you're producing uh, that it actually also impacts uh, the health of the ocean because it's, it's just not in your mind. Uh, and that is fascinating. And I know that you as a fashion designer, uh, you, you don't uh, just look out for the health of the ocean. You actually work with the fabric of the ocean and hopefully not just plastic. Uh, can you elaborate on that perhaps? So most of my work is around activism, where I try to get people to understand the detriments of their actions on the oceans, because uh, like I said, I think everything is connected to water. So unless we start with water, you're not going to go anywhere and we're not going to have crops if we don't have water. So working with the fabric of the oceans, I have worked with activism, again, using seaweed, using cyanobacteria, trying to create garments out of it. These garments were displayed and uh, it created a lot of uh, public interest. And at the same time, we're also looking into seeing how we can make bioplastics using seaweed. And that is basically one of the fabric of the ocean. So hopefully we will see a lot more innovation from the fashion sector, which is going to be beneficial for the healthy oceans. And just briefly, Runa, I mean, do you get support from coastal communities? Do they recognize what you're doing? Do they have suggestions? So we do work with a lot of coastal communities, especially with existing marine debris. And I think this is what I we did discuss last time also, but then we kind of expanded it right now to make it an alternative income for them, where we collect uh, discarded fishing nets and those are converted into fruit bags and reintroduced into the fashion industry. So you have beach cleanups that happen and rather than recycling it, which can you know create a lot more... Um, uh, a lot more carbon footprint into the environment because of the recycling, it's taken and actually remade into fruit bags. And this is again introduced in the fashion industry. So these are some of the few things that we do. Brilliant. Well, fascinating, uh, Runa. Uh, so good to speak to you again and great what you're doing. And thank you so much uh, for sharing uh, this satellite activity with us, Runa. Thank you so much, Monica. Have a lovely evening. <laughs> Well, moving on to the next satellite activity, which focused on a sustainable blue economy for a healthy and resilient ocean.
And for a healthier future, we need to ensure that ocean-based economic activities are sustainable. And this satellite activity aimed to raise awareness around the environmental, social and economic importance of fostering a sustainable blue economy. And for that, we now welcome, and I hope I pronounce your name correctly. If not, feel free to immediately correct me here. We welcome Inda Intiar. She is the outreach coordinator for the SOI Foundation's Blue Futures Pathways Program in Canada. She works to engage youth, educators, and employers in Canada's sustainable blue economy. Uh, Inda, so very good to have you with us. On, your, um, on the website, in the biography section, I saw that you love uh, storytelling and that you're happiest when traveling and being outdoors, writing about those experiences. Right now you're indoors, I can see, and presumably during the satellite activity you were too. Nevertheless, we look forward to the story that you can share with us now from that satellite activity. Thank you so much, Monica. Um, thanks for having me today. Um, the satellite activity, as mentioned, focuses on a sustainable blue economy. Um, it's, it's an important topic because, as we know, the ocean underpins our lives on Earth, and Canada is uh, the country with the longest coastline in the world, and our residents uh, depend very much on the ocean for our culture, for leisure, sustenance, and livelihood. Um, about $32 billion of our, um, of our GDP comes from the ocean economy, and the federal government uh, currently has started consultations on creating that blue economy strategy. And of course, beyond that, the ocean has also an unquantifiable uh, value. Um, but as important as the ocean is, we know that there are challenges uh, with overfishing and other harmful activities that uh, in and around the ocean um, that, it, that is caused because it's only catering to the economic lens um, of the blue economy. And so we, we tend to forget uh, the environmental and social cultural aspects, uh, you know, when we're building this kind of uh, strategy. And we all know that we need, to, we need the ocean to be healthier, not just for uh, humans, but also for other species. Uh, and we also need the ocean to sustain the livelihoods of people uh, for many, many generations to come. And so that's why we feel that the topic of what a truly sustainable blue economy should look like uh, should be discussed. Us, and we were really happy to welcome people from around the world, um, you know, for everyone from sailors, youth counselors, um, people who are uh, making climate innovations, uh, solutions, um, uh, mothers, uh, teachers, educators, scientists coming together yesterday at our event, uh, talking about these issues that we're uh, that we're facing and uh, many of the uh, many of the solutions that we can we, that we can support as well. Um, we were we had two speakers yesterday. Ken Paul, who also spoke at the core event, uh, he laid out the the concepts of uh, indigenous knowledge systems that we could help that could help shape uh, the values that we can bring into. Um, you know, forming this uh, sustain truly sustainable blue economy, uh, as well as Ronnie Noonan Birch, who is a master's student here in Canada, whose thesis uh, focuses on integrating the sustainable development goals into a framework for a, a sustainable blue economy, specifically focusing on the aquaculture uh, industry. So that's a little bit about the about the uh, about the. Um, the satellite activity that we hosted yesterday. We also had a discussion session um, afterwards, after the presentations, where people just exchange ideas about what challenges and gaps are they are seeing in their own communities and some of the solutions uh, and things that make us hopeful as well, things that are opportunities that we can support. Um, and on the slides, you can see that uh, some of those solutions, some of those innovations, um, and also some of the gaps and challenges. And then the middle there, there's a little circle uh, and the sustainable development goals as well that show us the things that we need to balance in order to create a blue economy that is sustainable uh, for the environment, for the for the people, and uh, and for the and uh, for economic viability as well. All right, thank you, thank you, Inda. Uh, I do have a couple of questions there because uh, your biography it also says that uh, uh, you have a background in business journalism and market research and I wonder what prompted you to be interested in sustainable blue economy. Yeah, thank you so much Monica. I think it kind of shows that there there are many ways to be becoming engaged in uh, in sustainability work, in the youth engagement work, in uh, climate work. Um, 
I think my background was in journalism, uh, but I came across Students on Ice Foundation whose, um, whose whole mandate, whose whole mission is to inspire this kind of sustainable leadership, uh, especially for youth. Uh, our organization has been around for about 20 years, uh, bringing youth to the Arctic, Antarctic and places in between um, to teach them about this, like uh, this uh, uh, ways to be more sustainable um, through collaboration, through understanding social cultural uh, practices, um, and working together. So it's it's very interesting how people can come from all angles uh, to help you know create a healthier world for all of us. And, and it's something uh, I've maybe it's me you know nobody's perfect. The SOI Foundation in Canada. Uh, SOI, I could not find what it stands for. Can you, can you, can you please uh, reveal that for us? Yes, it stands for Students on Ice uh, because ah. we used to bring, uh, well, we do bring youth to uh, the makes polar uh, regions. Yeah. <laughs> makes, makes sense. Um, I mean, what did you learn from this satellite activity? Because obviously you, you, you go in there with so much knowledge and with so much drive. Was there anything that you got out of it uh, that you didn't know or that you hadn't heard before? I think that there needs to be a change in mindset and values. Uh, I think that was one of the biggest takeaways um, that we need to first maybe focus on environmental protection and then social equity and then the economic uh, outcomes will come after that whereas in today's world I think I if I don't if you don't mind I'll read a I'll read a quote that Ken uh, one of our speakers said he said I find that in our society we look at the economy first and then we try to address everything else but with indigenous communities, the environmental and social aspects are as important, if not more important uh, than the economics. So I think that's a very different mindset that we can learn from and that can help shape our values going forward um, as well. And our other speaker, Ronnie, also spoke about the marketing of the blue economy. There's not it doesn't really distinguish what is the status quo ocean economy that uh, still includes activities that are harmful to the environment and or with the with the truly innovative and sustainable ones that is that you know pushes this environmental protection and social equity. Um, so she's actually trying to create a framework with her research uh, for that, which is very uh, important, and we're really excited to see her work come out. Absolutely. Uh, I, have, I have one more question uh, because, uh, I mean, now it makes perfect sense as a student on ice and, and bring them into those uh, areas. Uh, and what Ken also said uh, uh, two days ago during the core event, uh, the, the approach of indigenous, uh, indigenous communities to, to the world and also uh, the, the, the focus on, on nature rather than the economy and how it all plays together. Uh, do you, I mean, you know, in science, uh, in science, everything is about, you know, evidence and collecting data and having proof. This initiative, this SOI Foundation, uh, do you feel that by doing what you're doing, the people uh, engaging them and, and foster this kind of perception of a blue economy, uh, how does this manifest itself? Can you, uh, you know, can you map it? Can you actually say this had this impact and it actually worked or is it just a well gut feeling yeah i think when we think about this i think we don't it's it's kind of hard to explain but um there is already a blue economy that's being built that's towards sustainability right uh, climate resilience technology ocean technology monitoring uh, i think we've heard from a lot of the scientists speaking about that before as well and the the impact of that so what we're doing at soi is to try to support young people to get into more of those uh, we provide them funding some educational materials mentorship training and then connection to these uh, to people who are already working and doing those kind of things to help build this truly sustainable blue economy. Brilliant. Inda, just say your surname once for me that I feel that I've done you justice. It's NTR. NTR. I was very close. I was very close. Uh, well, then, Inda, thank you so much. Uh, and also for being so, such a good sport, uh, answering questions that I just came up with out of the blue. <laughs> but thank you so much. Thank you so much, Monica. On to the next satellite activity. 
and uh, that focused on ecosystem-based management in Aotearoa. Aotearoa. I even practiced that. That, of course, New Zealand co-creation of knowledge is important for meaningful change, and science alone is not enough. Uh, we definitely uh, learned that by now. And this satellite uh, activity illustrated a line of sight towards a healthy and resilient ocean via ecosystem-based management, drawing on learnings from the Sustainable Seas National Science Challenge. Uh, and uh, here is somebody who can tell us so much more about this, Natalie Prince. She is a doctoral assistant, a PhD candidate at the University of Waikato in Aotearoa, New Zealand. Uh, Natalie, good to see you. And obviously, we're very interested to hear a little bit more about this particular satellite activity. Yeah, thank you so much for having us. Um, yeah, the, the event brought quite a lot of things to the table and quite a lot of people as well from all different disciplines. So we presented what research is being done in Aotearoa, New Zealand at the moment to promote EBM or ecosystem-based management approaches. So as probably already most people know by now, ecosystem-based management wants to enhance utilization by maintaining a healthy marine environment um, within its ecological limits. And for that, we, we featured the Sustainable Seas National Science Challenge, which is a nationwide project with funding for over 10 years and research being done across 30 different countries. Um, sorry, 30 different institutions within the country. And um, we heard from emerging talents, young ocean professionals about some of the research that is being done on the ground, as well as theme leaders from projects of within the challenge about the barriers, but also the solutions to an EBM approach and how it can be realized. So we were working, um, we were talking to people from ecology, from um, social geography, environmental law, resource management, and towards the end, we also had someone from the ministry with us for a final panel discussion um, to also answer some questions from the audience. So what, what was the, the bottom line? I mean, did you, what, what did the participants bring to the table? When you say they were all experts working in that particular field, what did they bring to the table to, to make the satellite activity even more valuable? Yeah, so I think um, the main topics or even the, the main outcomes, maybe I could get the next slide. Um, we have a couple of keywords on that on that next slide as well. Um, we were mainly talking about the barriers and the, um, the solutions. So I will mention a couple of these words coming up um, now. First of all, the barriers were associated with a social issue and an eco uh, environmental or scientific issue. So the social issue is that we need to build long-term relationships between institutions, between institutions and communities, communities and the government in order to um, effectively um, work together because if it's just a project on the desk of a new person working in a new job, who is going to leave that job really soon, then we're never going to create those relationships which are really important to go forward. And legally, that fr this fragmentation is also a really big issue because different groups and different legal frameworks are very slow. Um, and it's also very slow to build these laws and policy processes, um, which then also need to be transferred into governance. Whereas on the other hand, the ecological or the more scientific issue is that we are documenting the decline of nature in the oceans, but we need to start thinking more about solutions. Um, and as we are dealing with cumulative effects, which result from the multiple stresses that, um, that we can see within the ocean um, or that the ocean is confronted with, we are getting closer to environmental collapse and science now needs to step up as well. We need to be focused more on restoring, on solutions, but these solutions need to be more profound and more transformational than just another model or just another tool. So I guess EBM requires structural changes and it is new and challenging. Um, and it's not an endpoint to which we can get. It's a constant process and we need to keep shifting with the goalposts, with how the ecology is changing and people are changing. Um, 
through an EBM approach, we can still have fisheries, maybe not in the way we have it now, but we can still have multi-use of the environment and we can still make process on, and progress on enabling the recovery and tackling cumulative effects. Um, but our economic system needs to change to some extent so that the incentives encourage more sustainable behaviours. Um, and yeah, as, as we've heard before from, from Inda and her team, if we take a blue economy seriously, it needs to be changed. It, it can't be business as usual, um, but it needs to be about the ocean. Um, and if those decision-making processes are underpinned by knowledge from all areas, from all peoples, um, then we can make different, different people's voices heard, um, ideally which are free from political and economic uh, incentives. Um, and from a New Zealand perspective, to add on to the Canadian one, um, co-management is being implemented increasingly, um, sharing power between different um, communities and the government. is. Um, we have increasingly uh, Maori values into legislation. And the key for collaboration is just, yeah, communication and the rigorous and responsibly conducted science and research so that the information can be delivered and affect meaningful change. Because as we all know, we are all good at talking, but sometimes not so good at, at doing, and that needs to change. Well, well, thank you. That, that's the perfect uh, bridge uh, you're giving me there, because uh, uh, what I take from you is that basically a healthy and resilient ocean, it can be done. We do have the tools, but one main part, one main challenge is that we have to change the economic system. We have to be prepared to change things. Uh, speaking to all those people are uh, part of the satellite activity, did you get the impression that they are willing and prepared to actually walk the walk and embrace that change? Yes, it definitely feels like it. Um, of course, we were just um, mainly talking to people who are working within the Sustainable Seas National Science Challenge, and everyone was really on board and, and super keen to be involved. We ended up having about 17 people involved in, in the two-hour event, which was incredible. Um, being a student and just wanting to contribute with something small, it ended, ended up being almost like learning so many different aspects. Um, it looks like everyone is is on is is on it is um, is keen to to make this change, but it also became quite clear that as we humans are quite slow in certain processes, we all need to pull our weight um, and and add to that change that is being that's underway in Aotearoa, New Zealand, um, in order to keep this momentum. All right, Natalie Prince, uh, thank you so much for sharing your satellite activity with us. Um, and I don't think I need to ask you about the vision because uh, that came through very, very clear in, in uh, your reporting on this satellite activity. Plus, the word vision almost doesn't apply here anymore because, as we said, it can be done. And visions are sometimes so far off, you know, and it is something that needs to be done, certainly within the decade. Uh, Natalie Prince, thank you so much. Thank you. Our next satellite activity takes us yet to another part of the world. It takes us to the Pacific Islands, oh, home to around a quarter of the world's corals. Communities have been looking after their reefs for thousands of years. And this session explored how science and knowledge can build healthy and resilient reefs for future generations. And for more, we cross over to Peter Davies. He's a coastal and marine advisor at the Secretariat of Pacific Environmental Program on Samoa, and he sent us this report. Hi, everyone. I'm very sorry I can't be with you today to, to, to share with you in this wrap up of, of the Healthy Resilient Oceans um, satellite events. Our event was a really was about um, the science we need for healthy and resilient coral reefs in the Pacific. It was a really great session. We had some terrific speakers. So firstly, I introduced the Coral Reef Action Plan. This whole program is based on a, a region-wide action plan for coral reefs, which was endorsed by, um, by members, by 
all of the Pacific Island governments. Next, we heard from Serge Plan on, um, on some really startling facts around the status and trends of coral reefs. Um, and then we had some, a researcher from uh, New Caledonia, Dr. Veronique Bertola Sellier, who shared with us um, how about some exciting work they're doing on identifying um, heat adapted corals. We also heard from Emma Kennedy, who uh, talked about the Reef Cloud Project. And finally, we heard from Siamalu Afeli Failangi around how we bring all this science and knowledge together into reef management across the Pacific. The Pacific Island is home to 27% of the world's coral reefs. It's of utmost importance for the Pacific Island people to, uh, to look after our reefs. As I said, the plan was developed in collaboration with the governments of the Pacific and, and looks for cross-sectoral and collaborative approach. It identifies eight action areas. Um, and all of these areas, science and traditional knowledge can feed in to, um, to and I, I employ you to download the plan um, from the SPREP website. So Serge shared with us, Serge was an author on the last Global Coral Reef Monitoring Network, Global Assessment of um, Coral Reefs, and he, he authored the Pacific chapter. Um, some really disturbing facts that the decline of coral reefs across the Pacific um, has really uh, accelerated and um, the aggregation of all the data across the Pacific so shows some disturbing trends and, and um, uh, really highlights why we need to take action. Uh, Veronique shared with us some really great work on modeling corals um, and genomic sequencing, which helps us identify where we can prioritize action and restoration. And this is all available through a really exciting app um, that's being developed. Um, Emma Kennedy showed how citizen science and photographic techniques can be used to then uh, fed into um, uh, digital analysis. And this generates great baseline information and monitoring that we can use to track um, our, our efforts across the region on how coral reefs are doing and how management interventions are going and also where we need more science and information. It also engages local communities in, in science and, and helps um, generate that knowledge in, in about the threats that coral reefs are facing. Uh, and finally, we heard from Afele Failangi, who is the director of, um, of, of environment um, and conservation in the Ministry of Natural Resources. And this, was, this is really important because this is where, where the rubber hits the road, if you like. This is where we take government policies, we feed science in where it's needed, and we help communities to take the action that they desperately want to do to look after their reefs. So it was a great session. Um, and I implore you to go to the Secretariat of the Pacific Regional Environmental Program website um, and download the action plan. And there will be a video of our webinar. Please take a look. And we urge all scientists who work on coral reefs or ocean, ocean parameters to, to join in this action um, uh, under the Decade for Ocean Science. Thank you very much. Uh, that was Peter Davis there from the Secretariat of Pacific Environmental Program on Samoa, sending us this report of uh, the satellite activity. He couldn't join us live, but we have this report. Thank you so much, Peter. Secure. Seascape Connectivity for Resilient Ecosystem Restoration. That was the title for this next satellite activity, which presented nature-based solutions to support restoration of another ecosystem. The aim is to accelerate the collaboration between companies, local knowledge institutes, community groups, NGOs, funding bodies, and IMDC. And if you say, what is this woman talking about? 
we now have somebody who can really fill you in. Let's welcome Lucy Gwen Gillis. She is an engineer advisor at IMD. That's an international engineering and consultancy company in the field of natural waters based in Antwerp, Belgium. Hence, uh, on the map, also this satellite activity in Antwerp. Lucy, good to have you with us. Uh, and after my very cryptic introduction, I'm sure everybody out there is really uh, interested now in what this satellite activity was all about. Thanks very much, Monica. So the satellite, um, the satellite session was really about um, looking at how we can use connectivity, which is the physical connective fluxes between ecosystems. And these actual fluxes, they support ecosystems. So like the physical flux from mangrove uh, forest can support the, uh, the development of a coral reef. And these can be really used effectively in nature-based solutions. And nature-based solutions are, are really a buzzword that everyone is using at the moment. So it's quite a site of development. But for nature-based solutions to really work well, especially when you're working with tropical seascape, you really need to have really, really, the really good community involvement. And that was something that we were really doing in this session, bringing together a lot of stakeholders and a lot of local knowledge institutes to work in the design and development of these seascapes. At the same time, we're also aware that we need to take bring sustainable funding to the table and it was really important to bring financial institutes and banks here um, into the session as well so we could really talk about how we can develop sustainable finance so it was really an opportunity to network on how we develop these nature-based solutions and it was really successful in that respect um, we had a very very nice conversation we had a very nice lots of developments and lots of future developments as well what well, you met uh, Lucy, um, what uh, or how important would you say is connectivity as a component of nature-based solutions for restoration of uh, tropical seabeds? Well, because connectivity um, really supports each other's ecosystems and supports the health of the ecosystems, it's a really sustainable nature-based solution. And nature-based solutions are basically supposed to provide us with services. But the thing about using a nature-based solution in this way is it provides services for other ecosystems. So we're taking it away from this very human perspective and taking it more to a nature perspective. Right. And it, yeah. yeah. Please, please carry on. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was just about to say, because of the really nice way that connectivity and using of nature-based solutions is sustainable, it makes these ecosystems actually more resilient to stresses like climate change. Mm. Now, I mean, what you're doing uh, when it when it comes to develop secure, i.e., seascape connectivity for resilient ecosystem restoration, what would you say is is the main hurdle, the main bottleneck? Uh, you mentioned funding earlier, or is it design development? What would you say? Um, I think it's it's really um, funding is tricky, um, and it's not just funding; it's developing sustainable funding, and you know. I know that banks and insurance companies they want to, to they want to invest in nature-based solutions, right? I mean, like a lot of people want to do more of these green solutions, but it's really working out how we can work together, and that's actually really difficult to do. And I'm not sure why. I'm not sure if we're speaking different languages. I'm not sure if they think nature-based solutions aren't a really solid investment. Um, but I think we really need to come together on this more um, because I feel like this funding really does stop a lot of things. At the same time, I also think one of the things that stops nature-based solutions have been successful. And what we really pushed in, in looking at in secure was that you need to have stakeholders designing the nature-based solutions and developing them from day zero. Because if you don't have the support of the communities you're working with, then, then you're your, your, your secure, your nature-based solution will not be a success. Absolutely. In terms of funding, and also perhaps including the stakeholders that are so vital to the success of it, uh, what could help? We had this big uh, sort of moment uh, talking about, for example, the role of the media uh, during the core event, you know, because uh, even uh, investors and, and uh, uh, insurance, uh, they only trust something when they are somewhat familiar with it, you know. What could help, uh, who could help convince them of this endeavor? Um, I, I think more and more um, they are becoming more trustworthy and, and you know, there's big organizations that push but I think the EU really pushes nature-based solutions. Um, and governments are pushing it. But, um, I, I, so I, I think it is already going towards that, how we can speed it up. 
Um, I'm not. I'm not entirely sure. To be honest, that's a, um, a difficult question. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I just thought I listened to you, and that was something I was interested in. But then, of course, we didn't have a answer to that on Wednesday, so you're in very good company. It is. It is a tricky one. Uh, but I'm going to ask you uh, one more question about the the next steps. What do you What do you see are the next steps in this? Um. Well, the next steps for us, I mean, we we had such a great time at our session. It was two hours, and actually it should have been longer. We should have taken three hours because the conversation was just like, and people were really coming together, you know. You could see, like, people coming together, those networks coming together. That was great. But our, our next steps, I mean, we've already reached out now to um, choose pilot sites. So or we've already emailed several people who are in session with what pilot sites we're talking. And at the same time, we're, we're making sure those communities are developed at the, at the same stage. So the pilot sites are the next steps, but of course we're looking for funding for it. Um, and we've, um, we're lucky because nature-based solutions are such a hot topic, right? That, you know, there's like the UN is funding stuff, UNESCO is funding stuff, so there are things available for us. But it'd be really nice if we got more banks on board, more insurance companies on mm. board, so that they can trust nature-based solutions to start funding them. All right, uh, Lucy. Well, hopefully, some of those uh, players uh, in industry are going to watch this. Maybe not now, but maybe they come across it on YouTube later, and they suddenly hear you speak there and uh, maybe get intrigued and interesting. Uh, I keep my fingers crossed. Certainly. Uh, well, uh, Lucy, thank you so much uh, for bringing this satellite activity closer to us. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and just to let you know, we have two more satellite activities uh, for this wrap-up for you. And the next one focused on restoration of wetlands and the East Ad on the East Atlantic Flyway. So for many uh, centuries, uh, degradation of coastal ecosystems along the East Atlantic Flyway of birds has taken place. There, there you see where uh, the activity took place. And... Uh, in this satellite activity restoration projects from the Lower Saxony, One Sea National Park and other areas of the flyway were discussed. And we can find out much more about this now from Dr. Gregor Scheifert, who works as a scientist for the Lower Saxon uh, One Sea National Park Authority and who joins us now. Uh, Dr. Scheifert, good to have you with us. Please fill us in. What was the satellite activity about? What did you discuss? What were your findings? Yeah, well, thank you, Monica. Um, well, we looked at uh, coastal wetlands from a bird's perspective, or in, in the course of, of the satellite event, it became more from just from a migratory species perspective. Because these, um, these animals um, migrate over vast areas, and um, for every day of the life stage, they need healthy coastal systems to survive. Otherwise, these systems, these systems of migratory species just would collapse. And um, so <clears throat> we just started from the bird's perspective and we just took one bird species, which is really dependent on, on dynamic coastal systems. For those bird experts in the audience, um, I don't know how many are, there are. It was the Pied Avocet, which uh, needs pioneer zones, which need uh, muddy areas, and so on and so forth. Um, and um, we see that especially this bird in our area is declining, despite um, the uh, development on the whole population. So we have to ask ourselves, so what's going on in our area, which is a World Heritage Site, that such an iconic species is declining? And uh, the key is that uh, also in our area, although it's protected for a long time, uh, it's not in, in, in a perfect shape and not in a perfect shape for animals which depend on dynamics, on, on a day-to-day -day or on a year-to-year -year change uh, of, of the mosaic of, of habitats. So um, what we uh, do in, in our area is um, that we start to um, to restore um, the salt marsh area. So the, the fringe between the ocean and the land. And that's where a lot of dynamic uh, appears. And um, may, maybe we could have my, my second slide. <laughs> that would be very nice. No, the second, please. Um, and 
Uh, there, there we start um, breaking up all the human-made systems so that uh, nature can take over the land again. Um, and this is what, what we start. And in places, if, if I could have the second slide, please. Um, yeah, uh, and uh, there on the on the left you can see what what's going on uh, on uh, on the upper part. You see this um, system we had, or this uh, human influence system, and there we just were digging out soil, and we were giving nature again more space to develop. And this was is a success story. Um, it, it's starting to get uh, more dynamic. The bird we are, we are looking for is reappearing. Um, but this has a lot of other advantages for, uh, for, for nature, as its uh, carbon sequestration is going on there again, um, and, and, and all these things. And um, in a second step, we were also looking at other places along the migratory route these birds are using. So these birds are connecting us with others. Uh, and in Portugal, we learned um, that they are restoring seagrass there, uh, from which also migratory turtles profit. Um, and uh, on, uh, on the other picture, you can see that um, you can see a mangrove forest, and we are partners with uh, a group in, in, in the Gambia, where they restore mangroves, um, which uh, again is, uh, is a system uh, which of course, yeah, most of you know about it. It protects the coast, and uh, there's also a lot of carbon sequestration going on, and so on forth. And what we were trying uh, to to stress is we not only have the um, decade of um, ocean uh, uh, science, but we also have the United Nations decade of uh, ecosystem restoration. And and the thing we found in find important is that we bring these two decades or projects of those two decades together. Because without the scientific expertise, uh, we, uh, we are lost in restoring ecosystems. Well, uh, this is the, one of the major messages that uh, with the projects we are doing, we have to bring together the ecosystem restoration on the ground with the science, looking at uh, the history of these systems, the measures taken and the future of, of these systems. Right. I mean, uh, Gregor, uh, thank you so much. Uh, and listening to you, I mean, it, it is a tall order. Um, that's also one reason why we're here. Um, and I think it became clear that even though uh, it, 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 the national park, uh, your national park in, in North Germany, uh, engages with global conservation, uh, obviously those migrating birds, uh, they, in order for them to thrive, they need to be able to migrate to a place that is also in good shape and, and has a healthy ecosystem so they can come back to you. Uh, I think that became very clear. But perhaps you could elaborate again on the role of ecosystem uh, restoration projects uh, in terms of a healthy and resilient ocean. What's the interplay there? Um, well, these, it's, uh, well th these ecosystems, of course, provide a lot of services to humans. I think uh, a lot of these satellite activities were, I think, also always talking about also the services a healthy ocean provides to people. Um, and um, and on, on the other hand, uh, these uh, systems, um, they provide coastal protection, they provide other habitats. Um, what I already said, they they store carbon, carbon sequestration. So they take the carbon, uh, but they help to mitigate climate change processes we we, we face. Um, and of course, they uh, protect uh, a high biodiversity, especially in, in a huge mosaic of dynamic landscapes like we have in the coastal system. We have a very high biodiversity. And, and this is also uh, something um, ecosystem um, restoration services for a healthy ocean we all need. All right, Gregor. Thank you so much for uh, sharing the satellite activity with us, for uh, your explanation and your exploration there, Gregor. All the best. Thank you.
Thank you. And we've reached uh, the final satellite activity that we want to uh, recap in this wrap up. Uh, and it had the title Marine Protected Areas in Brazil. Well, now you know which part of the world we're in. This satellite activity presented the first national diagnosis of biodiversity and ecosystem services and promoted the meeting of community leaders, scientists and the public sector to discuss what we can do to achieve a healthy and resilient ocean. So again, we have all the, the bridge amongst all the different and various stakeholders uh, in this satellite activity as well. And joining us for more now is Alexander Tura. He's a full professor at the Oceanographic Institute of the University of Sao Paulo in Brazil, and he's the coordinator of the UNESCO Chair on Ocean Sustainability. Uh, Alexander, thank you for joining us. Um, and yes, please do share with us uh, what was discussed uh, in your satellite activity. Thank you, Monica. Thank you for, for giving the opportunity to share some of the thoughts we, we had in this fantastic uh, opportunity, in this fantastic satellite uh, event. As you said, we joined, uh, we put together several uh, persons from different uh, areas of knowledge because we had the scientific knowledge in the meeting, but we also had the traditional knowledge being represented there. And one of the main aspects of this discussion was how to, how to get together these different types of knowledge in a way to understand the role of the ocean and understand how and where and um, uh, how to implement marine protected areas in a way they will fulfill the needs of society, the needs, including the needs, uh, the, the direct needs as the crab uh, collectors express it in the, in the event. Uh, so we need to understand the, the relationship with bio, between biodiversity and and the ecosystem service so that we can protect biodiversity, but also protect the users of uh, these services. And then our invited uh, person from the, from the traditional community that explores crabs in a mangrove area in Rio de Janeiro, Marcia uh, Santos, she emphasized that they need to have a healthy ocean so that they can uh, undergo their activities as crab collectors so that they have healthy crabs uh, to have food safety and food security. This is one important aspect that we captured in our, in our discussion. Right, and uh, let's let's dig a little bit deeper. I mean, obviously, this is the fourth Ocean Decade Laboratory, and the big headline, the Ocean Decade outcome that we're focusing on, is uh, a healthy and resilient ocean. So, in that context, what are the the pathways uh, for science policy integration towards that goal? Yes, this this is a very important uh, uh, process that we need to in, uh, reinforce or. Uh, enforce here in Brazil to strengthen so that we can put these different knowledge systems together, but also all the different interests. And then, uh, as we discussed it in the, in the laboratory, laboratory, in the meeting, uh, there is a need of a transdisciplinary approach so that we have all these different views of the system, but also a, a kind of arena where this dialogue could happen. And then this is, uh, it's, it seems trivial, but it's not because these arenas are not being supported anymore in our actual government in Brazil. So participation is not being uh, acknowledged as an important aspect so that we need to reinforce the need of uh, such kind of, of arenas, positive arenas to discuss and implement policies. And that is quite a challenging task, I can imagine. Um, talking about uh, Brazilian strategy, uh, the MPA strategy, uh, how is it collaborating to promote this ocean decade outcome, namely a healthy and resilient ocean? Yes, uh, Brazil, if we see the numbers, we have 26% of the Brazilian uh, economic ex exclusive zone being protected under a certain type of marine protected area. So we are talking about no-take zone, no-take MPAs, and sustainable use MPAs. But if 
although we have 26%, this doesn't mean that we are protecting appropriately this huge area, okay? And this, uh, this relates to the fact that these areas do not represent all the ecosystems or, or all the habitats we need to protect in Brazil, like rhodolith beds and deep sea coral reef systems. Uh, we don't even have a map of them here, uh, which is a huge challenge uh, for the next years. But we need to have the already existing MPAs truly, effectively, and fully implemented. And this is a big challenge here in Brazil because we have the MPAs, but they are not necessarily um, achieving their their expectations, the expectations for what they were created. So, so it's a big issue. So, so what, what is the importance of environmental and political comorbid, comorbidities, comorbidities uh, yeah. in order to achieve the goal of uh, the decade? We have eight years left, right? Yes, uh, this is a tricky word, comorbidities, but it's been widely, widely, um, widely spread because of COVID uh, pandemics. Mm. So we discussed about the comorbidities that we have that makes us less or more susceptible to COVID infections. This, the environment is the same. We have several comorbidities in the environment, so pollution causes comorbidities that cause that reduces the capacity of the environment to to deal with additional threats so when we talk about additional threats we may say climate changes okay and so we have polluted areas that have that are less uh, capable of dealing with climate changes this is an important issue but we also have the political comorbidities which are which relates to the decisions that uh, creates additional difficulties uh, to the environment. So here in Brazil, we have full of these uh, decisions that are not being based on logic, are being based on short-term inter short interests uh, to exploit in the environment. We are talking about the Amazon, but we are also talking about the coastline and fragile environments like mangroves and beaches, dune systems, uh, that are under the interest of the real estate uh, sector. So because the view of these areas are very nice. And then there is a strong push to use these areas, but they are fragile, they are vulnerable, and we need to keep them uh, not used or used for other reasons like protection of the coast and of people and livelihoods. So this is the point. We need to alleviate these comorbidities so that we have a healthy society, a healthy governance, and a healthy ocean. Well, I keep all my fingers and toes crossed that we uh, will achieve that, given the current situation and the world geopolitical, I mean, throwing even more uh, hurdles in the path uh, towards uh, the, the decade outcome. But Alexander, thank you. Thank you so much for your contribution and uh, for this uh, very important satellite activity as well. Thank you. Thank you. So those were the satellite activities we wanted to recap for you, but uh, there were many more uh, equally interesting and important. So again, you can certainly revisit everything uh, later on on the website. You can also, on the section satellite activity, read up a little bit more in depth what each activity uh, offered and what they discussed. Because this brings us pretty much now to the end of uh, the Fourth Ocean Decade Laboratory, A Healthy and a Resilient Ocean. This was the wrap-up. Uh, but wrapping up actually isn't quite the right word, Karen and Tim, is it? Because the work continues. Definitely. And uh, I think just this selection and this presentations of the satellite events highlighted something again, this local versus global issue that we always have. As individuals, we have a local perception of a local problem, um, but in many cases, we just learned it. It's only the local expression of a 
global problem that we notify. And in many cases, we do not see the local expression of a global problem that we are responsible for. That's why we always have to look at these global events. And it was nicely demonstrated, for example, by, by Runa Ray. So Runa, thank you for being with us. And, and being, it was an extraordinary contribution by somebody from the fashion industry. It's really extraordinary for us. But she nicely demonstrated how important it is. And she also highlighted this global north versus global south uh, problem, just saying um, this dying waters are, are there at the place of production in, in the global south, but the, the consumption and, uh, is in the global north. So that means our consumer behavior is uh, largely responsible for the changes to the environment in the global south. That means we have a global responsibility, although we do not have the local program problem here. That is very important. And another aspect that was also just highlighted by Gregor, um, it was nice to see these birds. One single bird uses wetlands in the high northern latitudes, then comes to Germany to the Wadden Sea, and then goes down to Africa to the, to the uh, high southern latitudes. And it needs the habitats in all these three places. Um, and that's why this is also a strong global trajectory, and it's also a kind of global responsibility that we all have. And of course, we can only do it in our local capacities and the places where we are. And again, this shows us it's a, it's a global task to which we as locals can contribute and have to contribute. And it's also nicely demonstrated by all the suite of satellite events uh, that we have. We had them from all uh, continents. Everybody's aware of it, and everybody picked up local expressions of a global problem. Yeah. Karen. Yeah, I have to say that I'm, my brain is almost addled um, with the absolute incredible number of really positive examples of engagement that we've seen in the past uh, two, three days. And obviously all the other people in the background who have uh, contributed to these satellite activities and everyone who was listening and coming into the chat and, and even the people beforehand. I mean, Tim and I, I don't think we ever could have realized that something that we were sort of planning a little bit on the fly, maybe every so often, <laughs> um, you know, had such a, has such an impact and is of such great importance. And for that, I really have to say thank you that we even had the opportunity to pull this together. And if I were to summarize um, what has come out, I would really say that, first of all, I think we need to continue to have platforms like these. Um, with little or large money, I think we just need, as ocean, as ocean custodians, to enhance these conversations. They can be a coffee morning, or they can be a big event like this. I mean, there's a lot of ways to do a communication, to, to enhance the communication and to, to, to give everybody a platform. But the one thing that's really clear is that this requires global thinking, which is the UN. It requires all nations and all peoples. And it really requires very multidisciplinary ways of looking at things um, and really peaceful interactions uh, and peaceful science. Because otherwise, you know, eight years are going to be too short. And we will achieve this, I think, with all these different people. If we have a platform, we don't give up, and we use all these positive examples, and then we might actually manage to move in the direction of a healthy and resilient ocean. And it was, for me, a really positive uh, yeah, three days. Thank you, everyone, for that. And, and I like the, the sort of really upbeat note towards the end of this uh, our Ocean Decade Laboratory. And I would like to thank both of you, Karen and Tim, for being the co-hosts. Uh, it was a pleasure uh, spending two much. events in the studio yeah. with you. So thank you so much. Uh, and all the best uh, for all the work, the very important work uh, you're doing, of course. And uh, there's very little I still have to say, but it's uh, important too, because obviously there was so much input uh, and there are documents 
documents, if made available by the speakers, they will be available on the Ocean Decade website shortly. So the website, the events website, will stay open for a while so you can browse through and download. The videos of both the core event, not just uh, the short highlights, but the entire core event, and the wrap-up can also be reviewed on the Ocean Decade YouTube channel or in the lounge, if you remember. Here's a very important reminder, uh, because uh, the IOC UNESCO needs your help. The United Nations Ocean Decade needs your expertise to assist the decade coordination and IOC UNESCO Secretariat with strategic, with technical and uh, review processes. Uh, and that is why they launched uh, something very new, very recently, it's the expert roster Interested individuals, and maybe you are one of them who would like to participate there, are kindly asked to join the Global Stakeholder Forum of the Ocean Decade and access the online form in the Take Action section. And because that sounds cryptic too, you can have a closer look at the expert roster, what it is all about, find links there. Uh, on the event platform, which is still up and running, when you go into the Ocean Library and you will get all the information there. This brings uh, the fourth Ocean Decade uh, Laboratory to the end, but as we just heard, the work continues and it is necessary. So if you want, uh, we'll see each other again in April because we now leave you with the invitation for the next Ocean Decade Laboratory, a safe ocean. And the dates you can pencil down already is April 5th to April 7th. And the invitation now comes from Professor Burkhard Baschek. He's the director of the German Ocean Museum in Stralsund and chair of the Safe Ocean Expert Group of the UN Ocean Decade Opening Conference. From me, bye-bye. Stay safe. Hello from the German Ocean Museum in Stralsund. My name is Burkhard Baschek. Together with Christoph von Hillebrand Andrade, I would like to invite you to the next laboratory of the United Nations Ocean Decade. It is dedicated to a safe ocean, a safe ocean where life and livelihoods are protected from ocean-related hazards. The recent devastating underwater volcano eruption in the large ocean state of Tonga was a recent reminder how vulnerable the livelihoods of people and the health of ecosystems along the coasts can be. The cascading events following the eruption have caused tremendous destruction by a tsunami, ashes falling on land and causing problems with drinking water, as well as the threat of introducing the coronavirus by bringing in disaster relief. On the other hand, also coral reefs were destroyed, at the same time helping to protect the islands. March 11 is also the anniversary of a devastating tsunami hitting Japan 11 years ago. The damage to a nuclear power plant in Fukushima and contamination of the area surrounding it had immense impact on the people living there and has ultimately led to the shutdown of nuclear power plants as far away as Germany. Hi, I'm Krista von Hillebrand Andrade, and it is a pleasure to greet you from Puerto Rico, from where we will be co-hosting the Safe Ocean Core event. To start off the discussions, speakers will highlight their first-hand experiences of the Hunga Tonga Hunga Hapai volcano eruption and tsunami. This will be followed by a multi-stakeholder panel focusing on how we can prepare and respond better to unexpected high-impact events. From the Pacific, we will move to the Caribbean. In the light of accelerating direct and cascading impacts due to climate change, scientists and government officials will address the different components of early warning systems and how, through integration, disaster risk can be reduced by 2030. We will then take a tour of the Science Decade actions that will get us to a safer ocean. The session will end with a panel on environmental justice and right and how to ensure that warning and disaster response actions include all and leave no one behind. This dialogue will be led by traditional knowledge holders. Following the core event, there are 25 satellite activities taking place around the world. The range of topics is very broad, including coastal inundations, safety for fishermen and divers, sargassum, oil spills, tsunami warning systems, as well as optimization of education and communication tools. The laboratory will be closed by the large ocean states of the Pacific, 
Please join us on April 5th to 7th to help us build a safe ocean.